a warm welcome here in our studio in Sarakonda. This is Star TV News and I am Mimini Juf. In the headlines tonight, National Human Rights Commission pays courtesy call on President Barrow. Fire outbreak destroys house at Manjai. Kitim Jaju and Suleiman sacked by EPRC because of their association with two years' Jeffna protest. Gambian government still ignoring 2012 drafted bill on people with disabilities. On the international scene, Libya's Haftar rejects Ankara, Moscow's call for ceasefire. At UN, US and Iraq invoke Article 51 to justify military action. Russia announces ceasefire deal with Turkey in Syria's Idlib. Those were the headlines and now the news in details. After 11 months into operation, the National Human Rights Commission paid a courtesy call on President Adam Abaro at the State House on Wednesday. President Barrow expressed delight at the meeting with the commissioners and said he had been following their activities through publications. He further encouraged them to work towards nurturing human rights and rule of law in our emerging democracy with neutrality. Ajaka Desanyang files in this report. The Commission briefed the President on its activities and the progress they have registered so far, including setting up a secretariat with a broad mandate of promoting and protecting human rights in the Gambia. The Commission already made several investigations, cases brought before it. The NHRC also held meetings countrywide to raise awareness on its work as an independent national institution. Its other activities included monitoring of human rights situations in the country, networking and collaborating with the UN and other institutions in Africa and outside. Chairman of the Commission, Mr. Emmanuel Juf, explained the purpose of their meeting with the head of state. Well, um, this was a, more of a court call. If you remember, um, the, a, almost about 11 months ago, on the 14th of February, um, five commissioners were sworn in. Uh, for the National Human Rights Commission. And since that time, um, the commissioners have been working. We have uh, set up uh, the secretariat of the commission. We have started our work in earnest, which is the broad mandate of promoting and protecting human rights. We have conducted some investigation. We have conducted some monitoring. And uh, uh, we have been collaborating and networking with the UN and other regional partners and also national human rights institutions of Africa and outside. So this, this was more of a court call to, to talk to the president about uh, what we have done and uh, talked about certain challenges that the commission has faced and, uh, and uh, perhaps how to improve things. So it, it, was, it was basically, as I said, a court call. And these things are important uh, that we, we have these court calls from time to time. Uh, to, to appraise him of, of what we think and uh, talk about the human rights situation of the Gambia. Mr. Emmanuel Juf did also highlight on some of the challenges faced by the Commission. Well, okay, these are general challenges. When you're starting an institution, as you know, the National Human Rights Commission is an independent commission. It's a permanent commission. It's not like the other commissions. Uh, setting up the commission, as you know, the government is supposed to also provide support and assistance. Uh, the commission can also raise its own funds. But um, as you know, there are limited resources when it comes to these things. So some of the issues we talked about also uh, was around that area. And, uh, and also some advice here and there, because um, um, uh, uh, Human rights, it's, uh, when we talk about human rights, it's partnership. It's, uh, it's between, between us. It's not between us and them. It's about the human rights condition of the country. And we all need to be in partnership. So again, we talked about uh, issues surrounding human rights issues. And uh, it was a private conversation. And uh, we leave it at that for now. But really, it was to, 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 just, to just talk about the issues that are uh, on the ground. Established as a permanent human rights institution through an act of the National Assembly, the body relies on government funding to execute its mandate. With a strength of 26 staff, they work in partnership with the government in promoting and protecting human rights in the country. For Star TV News, Ajaka Disanya. 
A fire outbreak has destroyed 14 rooms and left 34 people homeless at an extension compound in Manjai Kunda on Tuesday afternoon, 7 January around 2 p.m. when most of the tenants went out to run their daily activators. The cause of the fire is still not known but many believe that it could be caused by an incense burner in one of the rooms because there was no light at the time of the incident. Maria Madam was at the scene of the incident and she now reports. All items in the building were destroyed by the inferno, which includes furniture, TV sets, foodstuffs, and other valuable materials. Ibrahim Ature, owner of the compound, described the incident disheartening and unusual, saying the inferno destroyed a building amounting to $1 million, adding that fire service and neighbors who tried to put off the fire couldn't save anything. He also confirmed one of the victims lost a sum of $35,000. Fatumane, a victim says, she saw smoke coming out of the room and called for help at the time she was about to take shower. She noted that they lost everything, including their clothes, and as for now, they don't even have anything to wear. They appealed to the government and Gambians for help, as it is really disheartening and unusual. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Maria Madem. The Gambia Federation for Disabilities, in collaboration with Ministry of Social Welfare and Article 19 on Friday, 10th January 2020, celebrates and March for the commemoration of International Day for People with Disabilities, with the focus on why is the bill for people with disabilities still not submitted to the National Assembly. Dada Cham was at the March pass and she filed a serious report. After a march pass from Iceman to Westfield Youth Monument, the chairman of the federation, Mohamed Kurbali, said since the Bill of the People with Disability was drafted in 2012, the government is turning a deaf ear after so many promises to table it before the National Assembly. Mr. Mohamed reminded the government that the people with disability are also part of the people of the Gambia. More attention and protection of their rights should be given to them as any other person. If other bills are tabled and accepted by the National Assembly, why it's still the bills of the people with disability ignored after the president has also himself said that the people with disabilities can also be remembered, Mr. Kurbali said. The chairman promises to make lots of noise until the government answer to their calls, not only about the bill, but also to see the rights of these people are fully respected, including in the education and job sector. The occasion was graced by representatives from various organizations to reflect the challenges faced by the people with disabilities and ways in tackling them. Reporting for Star TV News, I am Dado Cham. We'll now go for a short break and we'll be back with international news. Welcome back after that short commercial break. And now, Denise, beyond our borders, renegade military commander Halifa Haftar has rejected a call by Turkey and Russia for a ceasefire as he presses on to take Libya's capital, Tripoli. Fighting between Haftar's forces and the UN recognized government has escalated over recent weeks. European and African leaders fear the conflict could destabilize the region. Al Jazeera's Katie Lopez Hodia reports. Libyan warlord Khalifa Haftar says the fighting will continue. A ceasefire called by Russia and Turkey has been rejected, and Haftar's vow to take control of the capital, Tripoli, has been renewed. Libyan Arab armed forces will continue to target the enemy by air and land, moving forward and spread its control of new forces in all areas from the capital, from the west of Sirte to the outskirts of Misrata. International concern is now growing across the region. Haftar met with Italy's Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte in Rome, hoping to stir support from the European Union. 
Then there's Russia and Turkey, which support rivals on the ground. Ankara has begun deploying troops in support of the UN-recognized government. And by turning down the ceasefire, Haftar could be pushing away Russia, one of his main allies. Fighting has escalated between Haftar's Libyan National Army and the internationally recognized government in Tripoli. Attempts to take control of the capital have fallen short, but Haftar's forces have gained ground, especially in the coastal city of Sirte. We'll continue to liberate Libya from the clutches of evil. We're fighting terrorism at the state and world level. Libya is strategically important. It has the largest oil reserves in Africa. The country's location along the Mediterranean coast has become a gateway for African migrants fleeing to Europe. Tunisia's president, Kais Sayed, met with France's foreign minister to warn about the potential consequences of the conflict. Together with my European and Egyptian colleagues, we are highlighting the risks of an escalation in Libya. It would threaten to destabilize the entire region from the Maghreb to the Sahel. Leaders from the European Union are banding together, warning that Libya could become a second Syria if a ceasefire isn't reached soon. Katia Lopez-Sudoyan, Al Jazeera. Iranian and U.S. officials have faced off at the United Nations for the first time since the killing of General Qasem Soleimani's Iraq's foreign minister, Mohammed Javad Sharif, was unable to attend the session in New York because the United States refused to grant him a visa. The U.S. has continued to justify the assassination of Soleimani, but it found limited backing for its action, even amongst its own alias. Al Jazeera's James Bay reports from the U.N. This was a Security Council debate about the UN's founding document, the United Nations Charter, key to international law and also central in arguments about the legality of actions by both the US and Iran in recent days. The US Ambassador Kelly Craft says the Charter justifies their assassination of General Soleimani. That says nations have the right to self-defense. Exactly the same article is invoked by Iran to explain its missile attack on US bases in Iraq. Our January 8th action against an air base in Iraq, from which the cowardly armed attack against martyr Soleimani was launched, was a measured and proportionate response to a terrorist attack in the exercise, in the exercise of our inherent right to self-defense in accordance with Article 51 of the Charter. Perhaps unsurprisingly, both Russia and China took Iran's side. At present, the United States' unilateral military adventurism has led to the tensing up of the situation in the Middle East Gulf region. China supports the call for peace by Secretary General Guterres. At this meeting once again, the U.S.'s closest allies were not giving a full-throated endorsement of President Trump's most recent actions. Five new members joined the Security Council at the beginning of the year, and diplomats believe the Council as a whole is now slightly less favorable to the U.S. than it was a year ago. James Bayes, Al Jazeera, at the United Nations. Russia and Turkey have announced a ceasefire in Idlib province. Syria's last rebel held stronghold, but past agreements between Turkey, Russia and Iran have failed to hold and aid workers are warning that the humanitarian situation there is tight. Russian and Syrian forces have killed more than 1,300 civilians in Idlib since September 2018. Al Jazeera Steve Vesson reports from Moscow. Now some breaking news from Syria, where Russia and Turkey have just announced a ceasefire in Idlib, the country's last rebel-held stronghold. Let's get the latest from our correspondent Jamal El Shayal, who's in the Turkish capital, Ankara. So tell us more about the details of this announcement. Well, Lauren, um, as we know, Russia and Turkey are the uh, two of the three main guarantors of the de-escalation process, if uh, we can call it that, that's been going on for uh, a couple of years now, an attempt by regional countries to try and bring uh, a reduction in the fighting uh, after they admitted, obviously, that it was difficult to bring a total end to that. And Idlib was, as you mentioned, the last remaining stronghold of the opposition. However, despite previous agreements, uh, and uh, these guarantors uh, reaching some sort of a deal to stop the uh, violence 
in the constant bombardment in Idlib, the past several months we've seen an escalation of attacks both by the army of the Bashar al-Assad regime as well as by the Russians uh, themselves. And that's led to hundreds of thousands of civilians uh, essentially fleeing Idlib, 300,000 in the month of December alone. And most of them, of those 700,000 over the past, say, seven to eight months, have been uh, heading towards Turkey, which has been an added burden, obviously, to the millions that are here today. So Turkey has said for a long time that this has to stop, that there needs to be an end to the violence, there needs to be some sort of a deal. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly what has changed things now, possibly uh, the Turks being able to convince the Russians, who are considered to be at least on good terms with them, that there is a need to uh, find a solution to this. But this also comes on the eve of a visit by the U.S. representative to Syria, James Jeffries, to Turkey. Um, so maybe is this part of something bigger? We're not quite sure, but definitely in and of itself, it is very significant. And, and tell us a little bit about the situation on the ground. I mean, who, who would police or, or enforce any kind of ceasefire? Well, that's a good question. I mean, there are uh, armed rebel groups there that, uh, for the large part, fall under the influence, let's say, of Turkey. Um, in terms of the regime of Bashar al-Assad, as well as uh, uh, their uh, proxies there, ultimately, they do uh, abide by whatever Moscow tells them. In fact, it was only a few days ago that the, Russian, uh, that the uh, Syrian president himself was essentially summoned to meet the Russian president in a Russian military base in Syria. So Vladimir Putin went to Syria, and rather than meeting Assad in the presidency, uh, Assad went to see him in a military base there, which some pundits would say reflects just uh, the uh, significance or at least uh, how the dynamics of that relationship work. So in terms of who would police it really, um, that's why you have those guarantors. Obviously, there are uh, certain groups that would maybe fall out of that sphere of influence, but for a large part, the uh, most significant uh, uh, firepower, let's say, is under the uh, direct or indirect command of both Turkey uh, and Russia, and obviously, by extension, Iran as well. Jamal Shayal, thank you very much. More than 200,000 people of Iranian origin live in Canada, and the community has been devastated by the crash of Ukraine International Flight 762. At least 63 Canadian citizens died in the crash, and more than three quarters of the passengers were traveling on to Toronto. Al Jazeera's Daniel Lag reports from Toronto. Across a vast country, grief, devastation, loss. Iranian Canadians have settled widely and built lives here. It's no exaggeration everyone in the community knows someone connected to the tragedy. Iman Gadarpana, just 36, was a real estate agent in a largely Iranian Canadian area near Toronto. He and his wife were returning from visiting her family in Tehran. Yeah, very positive attitude, very upbeat. Young, aggressive, very busy. He had it all. He had the wife he wanted, the job he wanted, the life that he chose, that he wanted. It could have been something great. Iman's wife, Peri Naz, worked in a bank and was a relentless fundraiser for a top Iranian-Canadian cultural festival. The organization doesn't know what it will do without her. Today we realize she's no longer with us. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big gap that we have to fill in our uh, committee and in our uh, charity. Nearly 30 victims of the tragedy came from the western city of Edmonton. A small Iranian-Canadian community there has been gathering for vigils to remember the dead. Among them, two married professors from the University of Alberta and their young daughters. This Iranian-Canadian member of parliament has been meeting his constituents almost constantly since news of the crash emerged on Wednesday. There are times like this that we are really not a hyphenated Canadian and we're just a Canadian. And um, as Prime Minister always said, a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. So uh, although it has hit our community, um, everyone in the community knows someone that knows someone. With its impact on diverse communities from Iranian Canadians to academics, the business world and professions, this tragedy is going to continue to resonate. Even beginning the healing process will take a long time. Daniel Lack, Al Jazeera, Toronto. And before we end the news, a recap of our main headlines. National Human Rights Commission pays courtesy call on President Barrow. Fire outbreak destroys house at Manjai. 
Kitim Jaju and Suleiman Sak by APRC because of their association with two years' Jatna protest. Gambian government still ignoring 2012 drafted bill on people with disabilities. Well, that's all for this edition of the news. Please enjoy the rest of our programs and join us tomorrow for more news. Thank you.